hello everyone. I see we've got Michael. Welcome. Just Janice, Lilo Main. Good to see you. Thank you for helping out again. Dr. Obvious, 1 p.m. in Indiana, USA. Horse, of course. Uh, we've got... Okay, well, yeah, guys, thank you. Good to see you all. And uh, Obvious tells me my connection is excellent. Yeah, so today is... Well, it was wet and rainy, freezing cold, but it's improved a bit here in Warsaw. And I am looking forward to spring. So, yeah, guys, thanks again. Uh, today we are talking, of course, about nominalism. This philosophy that undergirds a lot of the insanity, the transanity, and other bad ideas that, that are running rampant in society today. Right. So thanks, Lola Main, for advertising it. Yes, the um, this particular presentation is available in my coffee shop. Lola Main just dropped it in the chat. I'll try and pin it. I'll pin the message. So if you'd like to purchase this particular presentation and get all of this information. It is, uh, let me see, it is 77 pages. And hopefully it'll be helpful to you with your own discussions, your own learning, and hopefully you'll be able to use this stuff effectively within your own social group, online media, and so on. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, Francis Boole, Ernesto, welcome. Yeah, let's dive into this. I want to show you guys something new I've also been working on because I'm probably working on at least half a dozen different projects at any given time. Let's, let's dive in here. Um, currently, I'm working on, I have 27 slides done. I'm guessing this is probably going to be closer to 200 slides when I am done. Um, this is Gnosticism and early Christianity. And I did promise before that I would go back to the issue of Mary Magdalene. I would go back to um, the Gnostic Gospels and Dan Brown, or shall we say Dan Brown, the Da Vinci Clown. Right, because I, I do need to go back to that issue. Of course, there is the claim that these Gnostic Gospels were the original Gospels, the early Gospels. And of course, we need to put that particularly stupid idea to rest. So I said, this is going to be very lengthy. This is probably going to be the longest presentation I've ever made. It's I'm, I'm guessing it's going to be around 200 slides when it's done. So yeah, but this is going to be a really detailed step-by-step -step investigation into the whole history of the, the New Testament versus, you know, in terms of the, the Gnostic Gospels from Nag Hammadi through to the development of the test the Testaments and the early Christians. We need to look into that. I've got a lot of plans as well. Obviously, to keep up with the volume of work that I've got at the moment to put out, I'm going to have to increase my streaming rate. I'm going to have to stream like three, four days a week if I want to actually get through all this material. I, I don't know if that would be something you guys can cope with. <laughs> I'm not sure if I could cope with that. Getting that old black magic buffering. Yeah, I'm not sure why, horse. I'm I'm looking, everything's looking green right now. <laughs> are we going to like what we hear? <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, when, when your original Gnostic Gospels are 4th century and the Gospels themselves are 1st century from the year 50 to the year 80, and these Gospels that come afterwards that, that people claim are, you know, the originals, the unaltered originals, the... the you know, that have, n nothing's changed in them, you know, perfectly preserved, and they're from the 4th century, I mean, you got to go like, come on, man, please, please. You know. Okay, so yeah, thanks all. So yeah, the chat's filling up. Welcome, Jazzy Ways. The Gospel of Thomas is a forgery, 34th century. Yeah, I mean, it's possible it may be earlier, because it does seem to, but the thing is, all of these Gospels quote, all of these Gnostic Gospels quote earlier Gospels, which means they come after Okay, so let's dive into this. So this one is 27 slides. I've, it's going to be a lot of work. Um, it's going to take me a couple of months to complete. I'm working through a lot of material. This is one of the slides that I just finished like five minutes ago before I had to reboot my computer. I always do that, I reboot before I start streaming. So yeah, I, I just finished this slide. I mean, so here you go. Jesus crucified 33 AD. The New, Gnostic Gospel, sorry, the New Testament Gospels and Acts are written here. Then the original Greek Gnostic Gospels, and then the Coptic Gnostic, 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 Coptic Gnostic Gospels at Nag Hammadi. And this this runs from like 250 to about 380 approximately. ZZ Top, didn't those guys, aren't those guys the founders of Texas? Right. So Da Vinci, da Vinci Code was Gnostic fiction. Yes, it was. So someone in the Instagram comment section saying Christianity was really Gnostic and that Jesus' spinal fluid. 
yeah, it's gotten out of hand. It has seriously gotten out of hand. You're right. Yeah, the Gospel of Thomas was discovered in Coptic. All of these were discovered in Coptic, effectively. But Coptic is a form of Greek. Understand? Coptic is a form. It's like an Egyptianized form of Greek. One of the things I will discuss as we go forward. Um, for this example, for this particular presentation, I'll be using a lot of work from Dr. Michael Heiser. I really like his work. I, I thought he was a great scholar. I, I can't say I necessarily agree with everything. Obviously, he comes from a particular evangelical background. But that said, the, the guy seems to be a fantastic scholar. I really, really, I'm very sad that he died so young. I think he would have continued to deliver some fantastic work. So, yeah, let's, let's continue. Um, okay, let me close this for now. All right. And let's continue where we left off. Okay, so, um, right, now we're going to have to talk about Dr. Martin Lucifer, right? This is very important. Now, now, as you know, the very last time I did this, <laughs> may not dangly, but yeah, I, look, I must apologize for my language. I, may, maybe I need to tone it down, but uh, yeah, man, I, you know what, you know what's crazy? I'll, this is, okay, this is, this is fake. It's a training knife. It's a real thing, but it's training. It's, it's here next to me because I occasionally teach people how to use these things. Right? There's a long story attached to that. I also have one of these. It's plastic. It's a toy. Right? I take, actually, it's a training weapon. It's, it's a scale model replica. So, yeah, I, I fiddle with these things. So, understand that's the background I come from. I don't come from seminary. I come from teaching people how not to die. So, that's... Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, when, when I see things that annoy me, I, I have a slightly different reaction than, uh, you know. <laughs> see, so yeah, I've got, I, I've got like three more knives or four more knives on my bed right now because, uh, you know, I'm busy prepping and working. I've got some private stuff, etc. So yeah, understand. Um, the bluntness is so entertaining. <laughs> okay. Well, great. <laughs> Never tone it down. Thanks, Rosanne. Thanks, Lilo Maine. Always default to Old English, twigs and berries. <laughs> Welcome, Tom. Uh, okay, yeah. Okay, guys. So, now, a couple of days ago, of course, this guy came on, this um, nominalist. And I actually realized I knew his name because I had watched his channel. I had watched some of the philosophies. And, I mean, I hope that I've done a, a credible, honest job of deconstructing what nominalism really is, and when taken to its logical conclusion, how ridiculous it actually is. Once you, once you look at what these philosophies are in plain language, once you apply them logically, you start to see these are irrational. These are insanities, right, that have been allowed to flourish. Now, of course, they can dress these up in very complex language. So after that encounter, I decided to, to go and do another analysis of, and I've added a few slides. So for those who've purchased the slides or those who intend to, um, I need to update these slides tomorrow. Um, so please re-download them again or send me a message and I will airsofting. Have I been airsofting? Uh, a long time ago, I used to train with a friend of mine. We, we had a bunch of airsoft guns and we would train. Uh, we'd go to a site that we had access to and we would practice up stairwells, down stairwells, um, long corridors, uh, you know, so we would practice. That was with with air, with airsoft guns. I mean, we'd have pallets all over the all over the place. That was a lot of fun. Um, yeah. So. So yeah, I've, I I miss those days when I was a lot more active with with you know with uh, when I knew people that knew people. So yeah. Okay. So what I've done is I've added some new material, right, to to further illustrate this this idea of uh, nominalism and how how the how the nonsense can be hidden within this scientific language that, that's just designed to bend your mind into knots. Stay warm there in Poland. Will do. Thanks, Sheikh Biadi. Good to see you. Okay, guys, let's, let's dive in. Um, so, Martin Luther was a Calvinist, right? Or Calvin was a Lutherist. Um, take your pick, right? Now, we need to briefly talk about the 97 theses. So, actually, I need to find... Uh, Let's actually do this one.
that's the one. Okay, so before I get to that, let's finish these slides. And wow, thank you, Sheikh Biadi. Much appreciated. Thank you. Connor, wow, Sheikh Biadi, thank you. I'm, I'm really grateful. And thank you very, very much. Honestly, I, I'm so grateful. Thank you. Um, yeah, speechless. Um, so yeah, yeah, very generous. And I'm, I'm very always very grateful. Um, yeah, I've been able to get some extra resources and I'll be working on that. I've been working through the Luther material that, that I was able to purchase the entire Luther series. Um, okay, so on this, let, let's talk about this, right? And thanks, Connor, for following me on Twitter. So Martin Luther is famous for his 95 theses, but few people realize that before he published his 95 theses, he had first written the 97 theses, right? So before the 95 theses of November 7, 1517 in September, he published the what he called the Manifesto of the New Reform Movement. This 97 Theses was the manifesto of the new reforms that he was going to make. And these reforms were based on rejecting logic. Martin Luther decided consciously to reject reason. Right, so this that quotes according to Andrew Pettigree from Brand Luther, New York, 2015, page 51. And this thesis contained 97 Theses on his radical views on salvation and human nature. He argued against Aristotle. He argued against scholastic theology. Now, scholastic theology was not a form of theology. It is a methodology for arriving at truth, a rigorous method for determining truth. Right. I did get your email, Kevin. Yeah. So, and also, he discussed his views on free will. Now, this particular sermon, right, or this particular disputation, well, this particular thesis became known as the disputation against scholastic theology, right? Now, again, scholastic theology is not a form of theology. It's a method of merging reason with faith, right? It is your reason trying to understand faith. It's your reason trying to grapple with faith and to make faith reasonable, right? So it's, it's your faith seeking understanding through reason. It's reason seeking understanding through faith, but it's a rigorous methodology for determining truth and determining error. So, Martin Luther, of course, there asserted sola fifis, right? And this was his definitive public refutation of scholastic teaching that human will, that free will, can seek God and act, virtu well, act virtuously. Martin Luther did not believe that you, as a human being, can seek God and act virtually, vir virtuously. This was not possible, according to Martin Luther. So he rejected the idea that sinners could express God's grace through any actions. In other words, you were absolutely, positively unable to do good. You were so steeped in evil. Welcome, Dr. Jonathan Gemmel. You were so steeped in evil. You were so steeped in, in your own human filth, in your depravity. Nothing you did could be good. And therefore, all of your actions only were evil. Your mind could only produce evil thoughts that were despicable to God. And therefore, the only thing that could save you was the hand of God reaching down into the muck and saving you. And there was literally nothing you could do. Right. So he rejected the idea that sinners could express God's great, grace through any action. So nothing you did was good. There was, you literally had no hope of doing any good. So because of sin, fallen humans have no desire for God. So in other words, you don't want God's salvation. You don't want God. That's an illusion. You're lying to yourself. You don't want God. You actually hate God. You are going to do evil. You want to do evil. Your mind can only make you do evil. Do you understand where this is going? This is very Gnostic because Gnostics believe the world is evil. The world was made by an evil God. All you can do is evil. All your actions are by default evil. So Luther argued against Aristotle's ethical teachings and he argued against logic in theology, just like, of course, um, William of Ockham. So now, Aristotle taught that we become more just by practicing justice. We become more virtuous by practicing virtue. We become better at things by practicing them. We learn how to love by loving people. We learn how to be generous by, by being generous. Right? So scholastic theologians integrate this idea into Christian theology, teaching that God allows us to exercise free will. We do good works to practice and to demonstrate virtue. So we demonstrate our virtue by, by doing these things and we get better over time. In other words, there's, in a sense, it's a communion. You draw closer to God 
as you start to do better. You express his will more and your will less, right? So Luther rejects this completely. And Luther says, we do not become righteous by doing righteous deeds, but having been made righteous, we do righteous deeds. And then Martin Luther says, this is in opposition to the philosophers. So he explicitly states he is acting in opposition to the philosophers. You cannot. So first God has to cleanse you, and then you can do nice things. First God has to give you grace, then you can do nice things. Before that, everything you do is evil, right? This is not exactly Christian theology. So, and then Martin Luther writes in his works, the will produces an act that is perverse and evil, right? Now, how do you know when you've been saved by God? How do you know when you've been given grace? How do you know? Does your nose turn purple? Doesn't the si does a siren go off over your head and your ears turn blue? How do you know? Right? Calvin knows, of course, and uh, some of you, of course, well, you know, what, you know what Calvin thinks, right? Anything that Calvin says, he got from Luther, pretty much. Although they contradict each other, hated each other at the end of the day, but Calvin's views very much derive from Luther. So Lutherans don't like to discuss these particular ideas. So your will, your mind, your free will only produces things that are perverse and evil. So when you're nice to your mom and dad, that's perverse and evil because your mind can only produce what is perverse and evil. What are the what are the implications of that? So drop your thoughts in the in the comments in the chat. So radical corruption, right? We are radically corrupt. We are depraved beyond redemption almost, and that's the bondage of the will, right? So he writes in the bondage of the will. So Thomas Aquinas. So sorry, our will is in bondage. So in other well, we'll talk about that. So Thomas Aquinas says that the spiritual senses of Scripture cannot be used to construct doctrine. Think of it this way, and we'll come to that in a moment. This is a theological analog of a very practical aspect within reason, within the world, right? In that, how do you do maths without numbers? How can you do mathematics? How can you do physics without numbers, right? How would you do calculations without numbers, right? So he says... The spiritual senses of scripture cannot be used to construct doctrine. We need to use reason, and reason gives us a method to understand, to evaluate. And then we can begin to construct a method. So we are corrupt on a fundamental level apart from Christ. We are woefully sinful. Well, but he says, yeah, you see, unless Christ decides to uh, send you some grace, you are 100% evil. Everything you do is corrupt. You have zero goodness, right? So... Now, one should not rely solely on personal interpretations or subjective experiences, right? Thomas Aquinas is speaking against subjectivity, which, in, which is inevitably relativist, right? So, do not have these subjective feelings derived from Scripture to establish official teachings or beliefs, right? We, because Christianity is not about private revelation. It is public revelation, right? So, Aquinas believed that the primary purpose of Scripture is to convey literal truths. So if scripture is purely spiritual, just you know certain impressions or feelings, sensibilities, then where's the literal truth? Where's the practical hard truth in it? Right? So scripture conveys literal truths and historical events rather than serving as a source for individual or subjective interpretations. Therefore, Aquinas cautions against using the spiritual senses of scripture such as allegorical or metaphorical interpretations. Who leans heavily on allegorical or metaphorical interpretations? Well, that's your Gnostics, right? And this is their basis for constructing official doctrines. Sola fifis, my feelings. Aquinas emphasizes the importance of relying on reason and logical analysis in developing theological doctrines, right? Some Catholic thinks doing good is accompanying transgenders, which goes against Genesis. Yeah, look, there's a lot of bad Catholics. Roseanne, there's a ton of bad Catholics. I've met all of them, I think. So Calvin and Lucifer emphasized limits of rational inquiry of Scripture. They go against Aquinas. They say, look, you can't use reason. You've got to use your feelings, that, that voice that talks in your ear, those voices, right? So, okay, now, Lucifer. Now, also, by the way, this happens to be also... History of Hermeneutics, John Barry, the Lexham Bible Dictionary. Okay, so these are these would be, uh, and that's also Andrew R. Talbot. This would be Protestants writing this particular um, analysis here. So Luther 
was Luther Fur was harshly critical of reason, right? He called reason a whore, right? Your reason, your intellect was a whore. It is the enemy of God. Reason leads only to sin. Luther and Calvin preached total depravity. All that we do is evil from original sin. So we are so hard-boiled in original sin, there is nothing good within us. That's a pretty nihilistic, negative view of humans, view of the world. That how, how is that different to the Gnostic view of the world? Very different words, comes to the same result. So in nonsense, the true human essence is an innocent speck of purity in bondage. So Gnostics believe that you have a sliver of the divine, that that God that was attacked by the evil God called Yahweh. So this evil, dirty God, full of darkness, attacked the good God, broke off pieces of him, splinters that fell and got trapped in matter. Your flesh is that matter, that, that little sliver of God. That's why you're a God. And you are trapped in that. You see, so we've got this sliver of goodness that is trapped in the matter. It's in bondage. And what does Luther, Luther write? The bondage of the will. What does he believe is his greatest work? The bondage of of the will, where your will, your good, divine portion is trapped. You see, so yes, it's like saying you are a billionaire. You, you do have a billion dollars, except it's stuck in a, it's trapped in a cage, which is inside of a vault, which is inside of a safe, inside where, the, where there's no key, which is inside the Titanic at the bottom of the ocean. So you are a billionaire. You do have it. You just can't reach it. You see, you just can't get to it. It's, so you really are a billionaire. You do have free will. You have free will, except it's on another planet. You see, this is how he simply rephrases the, the, this, this Gnostic idea. So, right, so this is very dualistic, right? This is the mind versus the evil body. This is Gnostic dualism. This is Martin Luther starting to show his Gnostic proclivities, his Gnostic ideas. Simply rephrased into, shall we say, a more Christian sort of theology, a more Christian language. After all these centuries, I'm utterly baffled by anyone buying nonsense. The ridiculous presumptions defile logic, order, and reason. Exactly. God always operates in order, logic, reason, and divine love. Thank you. Very well said, Dr. Obvious. But Martin Luther brought this stuff back with a vengeance. Let's continue. Now, this is Martin Luther when he speaks of pure spiritual faith. Pure spirit. No, that's Gnostic. You see, he is now counterposing faith with works. He's separating them completely. You see, this is Gnosticism. Am I making sense? Does this make sense to you? Does my analysis make sense to you? How he has simply taken the Gnostic idea and just rephrased it and made it look a little Christian. You've just described my wealth problem. I'm a billionaire, but it's somewhere I can't access. Exactly. It's stuck on the Titanic in a, in a vault on the Titanic. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's this is how he gets around it. So he's really describing the Gnostic idea. But um, yeah. Okay. So now Walter Kaufman. Walter Kaufman writes The Faith of a Heretic, right? Walter Kaufman. So, Lucifer called reason the devil's bride, a beautiful whore. And also, your reason is God's worst enemy. Now, I have covered this in detail, right? This particular thing. If you want to go into more detail, I will have to cover this when I do the Luther series. So, um, so I don't want to do that. I do not want to repeat this here, okay? Because it's fairly lengthy. It will take me an hour and a half to go through all the material, right? Um, but if you want to know more about this, and I go into great length and detail with huge numbers of citations, right? I'm going to go here, right? So you need to go to uh, episode two, right? You need to go to Prophet Luther versus Logic, Reason as a Whole. That's Theological Part 2, okay? Reason's Clown, Martin Luther here. You need to go to this episode here, for this information, right? I've got that in detail there. So I don't want to don't want to redo this because when I do the Martin Luther series, I'm going to repeat that information, all right? And then I'm going to be doing a lot of other material so that I don't just say, well, because people are going to say, oh, that's just one quote taken out of context. Yeah, but if I give you 200 quotes and they all say the same thing, you're like, yeah, how, much, how out of context is that? Or are we discerning a pattern here? Right, now, Luther says, there is on earth, among all dangers, no more dangerous thing than a richly endowed and adroit reason. So, yeah, if you have a smart mind, you, you pose a danger. You know, you're, you are, you are going to sin with that reason, right? You know, if we had Prozac, we could have avoided all this, you know. They should have applied high explosives to this guy. 
So he says, reason must be deluded. It must be blinded. It must be destroyed. And faith must trample underfoot all reason, all sense and understanding. Right? So that's Martin Luther. That's volume 12 in 1530, volume 8. Okay, so blah, blah, blah. Okay, those are the references. But anyway, we'll discuss those in the future. Walter Kaufman then asks, if we discard our reason, right? If we embarrass our understanding, if we take leave of our senses, how can we be sure that what we accept is the word of God? How do you know it's the word of God? How do you know it's not your own voices? How do you know it's not Satan talking to you? How do you know it wasn't that curry that you had two hours ago that's talking to you? How do you know it's not your tummy rumbling? If you don't have reason, how do you know? What are those voices? How do you assess them? How do you test them? How? Because it feels right? We think, do you understand? This is purely subjective. He leaves no method for determining truth. How do you know? It's entirely subjective. And for the realm of human reason must be separated as far as possible from the spiritual realm. So the realm of human reason must be separated from the spiritual realm. So yeah, I'm, so that's Martin Luther's, Luther's works, volumes, volume 26, Lectures on Galatians, 1535, chapters 1 to 4. And this was edited by Yaroslav Jan Pelikan. And of course, um, after like 15 years or whatever of doing these translations, he decided to leave the uh, Lutheran church. And he converted to the, uh, to the Eastern Orthodox. <laughs> so yeah. So we would then have to look at Luther's last sermon against reason. I'll do a very, very quick, don't blame the curry, but yeah, let's have a quick look. This is from the um, University of Arizona Library, right? It's just easy to find this copy, right? This is Luther's works. Right, and this is Luther's last sermon in Wittenberg, right, from 1546. And I'll just briefly run through Luther's last sermon in Wittenberg. Right, and of course he tells us the devil's bride, reason, the lovely whore. She wants to be wise, and what she says she thinks is the Holy Spirit. Okay, she's the foremost whore that the devil has. Right, the other gross sins, reason is a gross sin. All these sins can be seen, but nobody can control reason. It walks about and it cooks up fanaticism and claims that everything that pops into its head and that the devil puts into its heart is the Holy Spirit. So get, get rid of reason, facts, reason, evidence. No, 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 no. Can't have any of that. Can't have that stuff. Okay. And what I say about the sin of lust applies also to reason because reason mocks and affronts God. Using your brain affronts God. See, so Thomas Aquinas, anyone with a brain affronts God, insults God mocks God. They're not just feeling God, you see? So yeah, hopefully that makes the point. I'm not going to go through the entire book. I will come back to that in the near future. Welcome, Sandro. Okay, yeah, let's continue. Okay, if you guys want this particular book, The Faith of a Heretic, it's really interesting. Okay, Walter Kaufman, it's available on archive.org. You can get that here. He makes some very interesting points about Mr. Luther. Okay, now, Appearances in name only. All right. So, <clears throat> Francis, very welcome. I wonder whether it was chicken or beef curry. You know, curry is chicken curry is good. Chicken curry is good. But but yeah, look, you guys, we we don't want to we don't want to, you know, we we need to somehow make sure that we save the curry. Oh, just give me one second, please. Oh wow, uh, my good grief! Uh, one of my family members is in hospital. Uh, he's in a very bad state. He's critical state. He's had three operations in the last 48 hours. So I've just been informed. Uh, they're fighting for his life. Oh my gosh, that is... Yeah, so guys... Um, yeah, my... Well, he's like my grandfather-in-law. Um, if you guys would... would uh, wow. Not good. Yeah, if you could say some prayers. His name is uh, Mietek. Jadek Mietek in Polish. Uh, Grandpa Mietek. Uh, that's his nickname. So yeah, if you guys could uh, say some prayers. Not good. Oh, good grief. Okay, yeah, that's 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 very sad. Okay, let's continue. So, by the evidence presented here, right? If we give a man a wig and a dress, is he a woman? I will do his name. They call, Jadek is grandfather in Polish. 
and then it's the Mietek. It's just a nickname. It's like they tend to shorten Polish names. Uh, his name is Miroslav, or you know. So, but everyone just calls him Mietek. I think it's Miroslav. Um, Philip Webb says, "So Luther, thinking up all of this BS, could not have used reason." Exactly, exactly. It's it's self defeating. It's self refuting. It is um, contradictory. It's yeah. It's it's insanity. Yeah. So, now look, honestly, a man with a wig, a dress, and makeup does not transform into a woman. Now, they tell you that genitals, right, sex organs, doesn't define a woman, right? Sex organs doesn't define your gender, but somehow a handbag, lipstick, and a wig does. How is it that sex organs doesn't define your gender, but a wig, a dress, and some lipstick does? I, I don't understand. Right. Um, thank you. Uh, that's a really long name. Uh, Vincent Mundum. Right, thank you. So, intrinsic nature as a male member of the human species remains unchanged. That's your essence, right? Your essence doesn't change. Just the external appearances or the accidents change. So, according to Western philosophy and realism, a person's essence depends on their fundamental nature, not mere appearances or arbitrary labels. So, a man has an intrinsic form, right? Uh, of a male human being. This includes certain essential attributes like the XY chromosomes. He's got male physiology, male joints, male bone density, right? Males levels of hormones. So changing a man's outward accidents like hairstyle or clothing choice does not negate underlying maleness. Lilo Main says, my dad died with Parkinson's disease years ago. So sorry about your... Yeah, sorry about that, guys. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's sad too. I lost both my parents not that long ago. My mom in 2014, and uh, very suddenly, and my dad also. It was yeah, pretty, yeah, pretty harsh. So yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's nice to have them around sometimes. So hold on, Doctor Obvious says uh, prayers for your grandpa. Thank you. My cousin Nancy is in end stage Parkinson's and cannot swallow food or water. I'm so sorry. Yeah, my dad couldn't eat either. He had uh, cancer of the esophagus and he couldn't eat. So slowly starved to death. It yeah, wasn't pleasant. Yeah, Roseanne, <clears throat> Roseanne says, you never stop missing your mom and dad. And that's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Um, give me a second here. Uh Uh, horse wins the internet today. We wanted Cinderella, and the modernists give us Cinderfella. <laughs> Superb. Yep, yep. That's exactly what we got. Yeah, it's not pleasant at all. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so a woman has the essence of a female human, right? With double X chromosomes, female anatomy, and they can have ch children. They can they can have childbirth, right? And also other attributes that define her nature. So these essences are real and objective not determined by how we choose to identify or present ourselves, how we pretend to be. So people are free, at least under the law, to identify as they wish from a philosophical perspective, but transgenderism is inconsistent with realism. It is clearly a nominalist philosophy. This tells me, now with Martin Luther's irrational views on reason, seeing reason as satanic, and of course with this with nominalism, supporting transgenderism that tells me this is irrational therefore i have no time for trans for nominalism as a philosophy trying to pretend that it is a legitimate philosophy it is not a legitimate philosophy it is a mistake it is an error it is a corruption of reason so right so transgenderism is inconsistent with realism and classical views of human nature right appearances do not dictate reality so, a man does not become a woman by looks or by self-assertion. Maleness is built into our substance. Womanness, femaleness is built into your substance and your nature, right? Labels and attributes, changing a name, putting a new label on, changing a name, does not override objective facts about what men and women are. So, now let's look at the word nominal, nominalism. Let's look at the history of the word, right? This, is, this might be interesting, so... Nominal is an adjective. This I got from the online etymology dictionary. So, thank you, Donke. Yeah. So, nominal, adjective, mid-15th century, nominal, 
pertaining to nouns, right? Names, nouns, naming things. Welcome, Andrew, right? So Latin, it's from the Latin nominalis, pertaining to a name or names, from nomen, genitive nominus, meaning name. This is cognate with Old English, nama, right? From the root no men, meaning name. Okay, nama is like Afrikaans that I speak back home, nam, right? Name, nam. In of Deutsch has das nam, das der nam, yeah? <clears throat> so meaning, so the meaning of nominal is of the nature of names in distinction to things. So notice, nominalism, nominal, nomina, is of the nature of names, not of the nature of things. See the distinction? They're slapping a coat of paint. They're putting lipstick on a pig, and they're saying, oh, because now it's a lipstickified pig, it's not a pig anymore. You see, it's not about the nature of the thing, it's the nature of the name. It's simply a label. The label doesn't change the underlying thing. Can you see here that, in terms of the etymology, how there's a distinction? So the name doesn't change anything, really, except the label. Of course, the name changes meaning. Those people, Kevin, are talking absolute bullshit. So, now, so, meaning of the nature of names in distinction to things is from the 1610s, right? Meaning, being so in name only, recorded in the 1620s. So, it's in name only. In other words, there's no change to the substance, no change to the essence. It's merely renaming it, and that will come eventually to sort of, it's uttering a magic spell. Right. Nominalism, the view that treats abstract concepts as names only, not realities. The doctrine that common nouns are mere conveniences in thoughts or speech, representing nothing in the real things. Right, from French nominalisme, 1752, from nominal, from Latin nominalis, pertaining to a name or names. Now, of course, we cannot do categorization if things are purely subjective. That would lead us back to subjectivism. Right? Now, medieval thinkers, especially those of the 12th century, are classified as being either nominalists or realists. Modern philosophers have generally joined in the condemnation of medieval realism, but have nevertheless been mostly rather realists than nominalists. Century Dictionary, 1895. Now, let's look at the word denomination. Right, the term that we get denomination to describe different denominations of churches. Right. So de noma ne shin. D, right? De nomina shin. Denomination. Noun. Let's have a look. Late 14th century. Denomination. A naming or act of giving a name to. Giving a name to something. Right? So create so having something and slapping a label on it. From old French, denomination, nominating naming from latin denominationum okay nominative denominatio a calling by anything other than the proper name so hold on pause a second there okay a denomination is calling something by a false name what's a denomination so at the risk of offending everybody because i tend to have a knack for offending everybody baptist church well according to the etymology of the word that is a false name. It's not the original thing. It's a simulacrum of the thing. It is a facsimile of the thing, a cheap knockoff of the thing, a copy of the thing. It is calling it by something other than the original and proper name. Metonymy, noun of action from past principles, stem of denominare to name, from D, completely to name, from nomen, name. Okay, great. We'll continue. That's from the mid-15th century as a class name, a collective designation of things, of persons. So a denomination is a collective of persons, a society or collection of individuals. So now you've got a group of people, that's a denomination, 1660s. From the first comes the monetary sense and the second meaning, religious sect, right? Formerly around 1716, but let's continue. Let's look at the word D or the, the prefix D. Active word-forming element in English, and in many verbs inherited from French and Latin, from Latin de, down, down from, from, off, concerning, related to, derived from. Also used as a prefix in Latin, usually meaning down, off, away from, down from, but also down to the bottom, totally, hence, completely, intensive or completive, right? 
As a Latin prefix, it has also had the function of undoing or reversing a verb's action, and hence it came to be used as a pure privative, as in not, do the opposite of, to undo, which is its primary function as a living prefix in English. If we look at the proper sense of these of this word denomination, it is to undo. So you've got the Catholic Church, the original church, then you make denominations. These denominations undo the work of. They are a devolution, a de-evolution of these ideas. Understand? So in other words, as a denomination, what it implies is that this is a corruption of, this is a reduction of, this is a, a lessening of the original. So, <clears throat> okay, so let's continue. So hopefully that tells you something about the meaning of D de and denomination. So this tells us that these, technically the way I read it is, that's not real churches. Those are denominations. Denomination means it's less of, it's a, it's, yeah, it's a knockoff. That's how I'm reading this in terms of this, calling it by other than its proper name. Let's continue. Okay, does surgery alter the particulars? Does it make a man a woman or vice versa? From a Western philosophical perspective that believes in essences and universals, surgery and medical interventions do not change a person's nature. There's no fundamental change, right? Physical alterations modify appearance or attributes. They do not negate intrinsic form of a human being as male or female. A man who undergoes surgery to appear more feminine, having breast augmentation or genital reassignment, does not become a woman, in essence. So, his male nature, including XY chromosomes, male physiology, his life experiences and more, are unchanged. Right? The feminine traits was, that were surgically created are just accidental. They are external properties. They don't magically transform substance or natural identity. Now, a woman who takes surgical or hormonal steps to look more masculine does not shed intrinsic femaleness. Her essence as a human female continues. Her attributes only, the external appearances are modified, right? So surgery alters what we call particulars, but it doesn't negate the form, the universals. So the gender we are born with is built into our nature. It's built into your chromosomes, built into your genes, right? It is not randomly assigned or dependent solely on how we present ourselves. You're not assigned a gender at birth. You are identified to be biologically X and Y or X and X, right? Simply, you're assigned, you're just, you're, uh, he's got a, he's got dangly bits, he's male, no dangly bits, female. Very simple, right? And your mind and your body are very much integrated. So, who created nominalism as a philosophy? So, the beliefs that we see in the woke and the liberal community are nominalist, with people believing they are dogs or dragons or women or foxes or furries or whatever the heck they are thinking today. Denomination is a polite term for schismatic. Yes, yes, schismatic. Correct. That's something I'll tackle again in the future. I've got some great notes on that as well. Yeah. So, goedenavond, mooi mensen. Yeah. Dag, zei Erik Pas. Hoe gaan we jou? But a friend, Max, who became Maxine, also government paid for the transformation. Yeah. Good grief. So, let's see. Right. So, the woke community, the liberal community, these are all nominalists, right? So, nominalism arises in the Middle Ages, originally proposed by philosophers like Agarkul Doskelinus and Peter Abelard. This is a reaction to the very dominant Aristotelian Christian belief in the reality of abstract universals. So nominalists denied that universals were objectively real. In other words, they would also then deny that you have a soul, right? Claiming that they were merely names or nomina that we apply for convenience, right? Now, this view grew in influence with William of Ockham. Right, who said we need to refrain from positing the existence of abstract objects without necessity. So we've got this idea of William of Ockham, yeah, he applied his, uh, his razor to science, but actually he applied it to theology. He applied it to the Trinity, and he claimed that the Trinity was an illogical idea. Now, for a Christian to deny and to rebuff the Trinity and claim that either you've got a monad, which is like this one god with which is just the monad effectively like allah or you've got three separate gods neither of those are christian positions both of those are heresies right so now modern woke radical leftism and liberal identity politics are contemporary forms of nominalism they share the view that reality is defined by what we choose to name or identify as not by anything universal 
So people can identify as what they want. Animals, mythical creatures, a different race or gender, trans age 50 year olds that can go swim with, you know, 13 year olds, a man that can claim as a woman and go swim with teenagers and then go change in their locker room and then get in his car and drive when he's too young to drive at 13. Yeah, and then go to his job the next day when he's legally, illegally working because he's a 13 year old girl. And how can that 50 year old man be a 13 year old girl to have a driver's license and a job, right? This is extreme subjectivism, right? And this is a postmodernist stand in stark contrast with, with classical beliefs, right? With realism and universals. So by rejecting essences and forms in favor of what we call self-asserted identities, just pretense, nominalism paves the way for the type of absurd and logically incoherent claims we see today, right? This is, this is where nominalism leads. Take the logic, and this is where we end up. So if you're looking at transgenderism and other stupidity and idiocy today, then that's where we've ended up because of this philosophy, because Martin Luther decided to make this mainstream. So people declare themselves to be dogs, cats, or even fantastical beings because they feel like it. Sola fifis taken to the ultimate conclusion. This is sola fide taken to the ultimate subjective conclusion. So we need to, once we dispense with shared objective reality, the limits of personal imagination are the only constraint. And these people, as you can tell, are fucking crazy, right? So everything becomes possible. So nominalism dates back centuries, but it's become extremely entrenched today, right? We can see it in radical leftist identity politics. We see it in the woke movement, where self-declared identities override objective facts. Right, but it's missing essences of nature in favor of just naming things. Right, that's a magic spell. I'm just casting a magic spell, and you have to believe me. It enables crazy claims of anything. Right, so in a symbolic sense, self-declaring an identity without the external verification or objective basis is really personal spell casting or personal magic. Right, now they try to exploit ambiguities or lack of precise definitions to promote their own agenda. The advanced bias narratives, right? They undermine the credibility of ideas. The Gnostics did the very same, and this was a challenge to the church. For instance, 325 AD, the church has to do the first, the first council of Nicaea. They've got to create the Nicene Creed because they need to plug the gaps. They need to create very precise language. Now notice, we must have extremely precise language to prevent ambiguities. We need precision. The whole point of these philosophies is to undermine precision in language, to create and exploit ambiguities. So objective reality exists independent of our labels, of our desires and identifications. So from casting spells to propaganda, right? Propaganda is casting a spell. It's casting a spell into your mind, making you believe something. So a spell is a thought form, right? That gets into your head and it influences you. So Buddha called these illusions, right? A false perception or a mental construct. What do they call it today? What do the Marxists call it today? It's a social construct, you see? It's a mental construct. It's a spell. It's an illusion. You've been magicked, right? And these will cloud our understanding of reality. And illusions, he says, Buddha says, are driven by desire or aversion. You want to get away from something. So you either want something or you want to avoid something. So probably want to avoid truth and reality. So if we define spell casting as persuasion or influence, there are parallels between the concept of spell casting and persuasive rhetoric or magic or language manipulation, right? So spell casting is associated with magic or occult practices. Metaphorically, we can say this is influencing or capturing the mind with words. No wonder the, the woke are spending so much money and effort in defending Disney. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah, spells, spelling, words. Words are powerful. God created the world through words, through the spoken word, the logos. And God said, he spoke logos. Logos is truth. What is truth? Well, if it's subjective, then it's not true, right? Then it's if you have contradictions, if you have incompatibilities and contradictions, if everyone can define truth for themselves, that is not truth, magical thinking, exactly. So in rhetoric, okay, so in very persuasive rhetoric, hypnosis, mind control, suggestion, well, what's the difference? What's the difference, Robothug? If I suggest to you to give me money, or I control your mind and make you give me money, what's, what's the functional difference? That's a distinction with no difference. Right, so in a persuasive rhetoric, skilled speakers or writers use language techniques that capture the audience. They create emotional connections and they sway opinions or beliefs. This, in fact, would be very much like Islamic adab al-jadal, 
right? So in politics, advertising or public speaking, the aim is to create a kind of spell over the listeners to win their favor or gain agreement. Vote for me, right? So the concept of creating hypnosis-like trances can be related to the idea of capturing an audience through language. Skilled speakers or writers employ techniques to induce a state of focused attention. That's what television does. Leading the audience to be more receptive to the message and poten potentially influence thoughts or actions. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So, you're looking at some very closed minds that are not open to truth. Uh, NATO expressed interest in co-opting Taylor Swift to be a political influencer. One survey reported showed 18% of Taylor Swift fans would vote for whoever Taylor Swift told them to vote for. Yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah. But, um, I mean, the Taylor Swift thing, it's... I mean, sure they did, but uh, whether she'd be that effective, uh, that's the jury's kind of still out, and then I've seen some other figures data on the other side of that. Yeah, tell a vision, tell a vision, tell a vision. Yeah, you can start to play with words. I mean... I've learned some of this stuff back in the past. So anyway, ethical persuasion influence. So persuasion that relies on propaganda, control of media, censorship, or suppression of free speech raises questions about the integrity and the effectiveness of those ideas. In many places, if you disagree that a man is a woman, you can go to jail, right? If they have to enforce this with lawfare, then maybe this is not a very good idea. People aren't believing it and they can only compel you. That is compelled speech, right? So a healthy, rational society values open dialogue. It values critical examination and the free exchange of ideas. Programming, yeah, it's a program, programming you, right? When these principles are compromised, right, you cannot engage in reasoned discourse or challenge ideas through logical examination. Now, important point, when you use logic, when people have logic, right, and then you listen to these incoherent ranting fools with their crazy ideas, like the nominalists, right, when you compare the two, clearly the one is incoherent. It's not able, it's not logical. It can't systematize, systematize things. Like I said, how can you do maths without numbers? So now they have to then fundamentally corrupt language as well. Because now, fine, they, they, you're going to have to engage in a discourse here. You're going to have to deal with these ideas logically. So they've got to undermine logic. They've got to corrupt words. They've got to create new definitions. When someone starts making new definitions, then you are being lied to. When they're redefining everything to suit their particular agenda. Right? And if these words are meaning different things, and if it's different, if it's different, if one plus one is equal to two for me, but it's three for you and five for him, 12 for the next guy and seven for the other one, how can you talk about anything rationally and logically? How can you have a scientific discussion on categories within science if, if there is no category? How can you order things if there is no order? Do you understand the chaos that this is causing? So reason, critical examination, are foundational in evaluating ideas and determining the validity of these ideas. Now remember, Martin Luther said, well, away with reason. Now, if you don't have reason, how can you determine the validity of ideas? How can you evaluate them? What criteria do you use to evaluate beyond my feelings? So these reason provides us with the tools to evaluate arguments, right? We can subject claims, arguments, and beliefs to scrutiny. We need something that is objective, a standard, a method. That's what scholastic theology was, a method. And this helps us to assess logical consistency, right? It's evidence-based, and we can then support the conclusions based on the evidence, and we can reach, and we can examine the ethical implications of an idea. And of course, they want to go against all of this. So if a society values reason and critical examination, there must be room for differing perspectives, right? There must be respectful debate. We must be able to challenge ideas without fear of retribution. And you know... These days, try in the workplace to say you don't like the DEI stuff. They'll come down on you. You lose your job. You end up in the news. You are vilified. You are hounded out of society. So open dialogue and the ability to express and discuss ideas freely to allow the identification of flaws, biases, logical inconsistencies. All of this means that we have better societies, better arguments, better evidence, better conclusions, right? This all contributes, but here they want to undermine and prevent all of this. So Lloyd, that's happening all over science, especially in situations like Lee Cronin's assembly theory. Um, man, I've been looking at some of the origin of life stuff, and that's a bunch of, a lot of it seems to be nonsense. Um, but that said, for instance, someone else not Harvard, there's a second black woman at Harvard, discovered to have 40 cases 
they've discovered so far of plagiarism in her dissertation, her PhD dissertation, 40 examples. And it seems she, she, she also took a lot of her dissertation from her husband who wrote a dissertation on a similar topic and she just copied stuff from him. And then she's only published one paper in her whole career. And there's problems with that one too. So yeah, there's a lot of this stuff going around. Okay, now, it is also a primitive pagan philosophy, right? So nominalist thinking can be traced back to the ancient Greek philosophers. Just like atheism, just like materialism, just like all of this poop that we've been dealing with over the last few weeks, we can go back to the pagan Greeks, right? And these people were opposed by Aristotle because Aristotle was, was a fantastic thinker, okay? Western thinking is based on Aristotle. We're now going towards paganism. So Heraclitus or Heraclitus or whatever you want to call him, he believed that all of reality is in constant flux. There is no stable essence. There are no stable forms. You see, oh my gosh, I just turned into a butterfly. Can you see the butterfly me? I'm amazing, aren't I? I'm a, I'm a bear now. Look at me. Look at my five o'clock shadow. That's bear shadow. Oh yeah, yeah. Me, big bear. Oh, I'm back to being Lloyd now. Isn't that amazing? I was in constant flux. I know I'm sitting here. I don't seem to be doing much, but I can tell you at a cellular level, I'm very busy. So yeah, do you understand how this is just... It's the ancient Greeks that are responsible for everything else. Well, we've also got to go to the ancient Egyptians. When you talk about Gnosticism, then we are going to have to go to the ancient, the ancient Egyptians because they gave us the crap that is... Well, actually the Greeks as well, but, but then you've got to go to uh, Hermeticism. And from Hermeticism, you've got to go to the Greeks because they just picked up on it and ran with it as well. So Heraclitus, all reality is in flux. Nothing is solid. Everything is shifting. There's, there's no certainty. Everything is just mo chaos. Everything is chaos. So yeah, there we go. Thanks, man. Thoth, exactly. Huynathvoid, lekker warme kaap. Yeah. Recently found your channel and your videos on Gnosticism and its prevalence have been insane. Thank you. I thought of doing a video on Freemasonry in SA's history. Um, look, I'm about to do stuff on Freemasonry, but look, I've got like 40 different presentations I have to get through <laughs> um, that I'm going to have to pick up the pace. But also I'm about to do Freemasonry, starting with a man called Napoleon, right? And I'm going to look at how Napoleon interacted with the Freemasons, although he does not seem to have been a Freemason at all. But he interacted extensively with the Freemasons. He understood how they operated and he utilized it to his benefit. But then from there, we're going to go from Freemasonry to the Catholic Church. But along the way, we're going to meet a group called the Carbonari. And the Carbonari, well, you will find lots of Freemasons and lots of good Catholics, good Catholics who will tell you the Carbonari have nothing to do with the Freemasons, except that's not true. And then we're going to find out that from the Freemasons, you go to the Carbonari, you go to the Alta Vendetta. Alta Vendetta, this basically is a method or a plan that they created, a book, but it's also the name of a group that we're going to destroy the church, all churches, but specifically the Catholic Church, of course. And then, of course, from the Alta Vendetta, so from the Freemasons, you're going to go to the to the, to the the Carbonari. From the Carbonari to the Alta Vendetta. From the Alta Vendetta, you're going to go to Karl Marx. And from Karl Marx, you're going to end up in Satanism. So, yeah, you're going to go straight from Freemasonry to Satanism, and you're going to wonder how you got there. So, understand. So, we're going to go straight from Freemasonry to Satanism via Karl Marx, and we're going to think, how the heck did we just arrive at this point? So, yeah, we're going to talk about that in the near, relatively near future. So... Protagoras, not Pythagoras, Protagoras, right? So he argued that man is the measure of all things. So your senses only are what's true, entirely subjective and completely within your own skin, right? So what individuals believe or perceive is reality for them. My truth, your truth, his truth, that truth. Everyone gets a car, you get a car, you get whatever, okay? This is radical subjectivism. And this suggests that essences depend on what we name or identify. It only becomes true when we name it. It only becomes true when we label it. Other than that, it's just chaos. It's nothing. But once we put a label on it, now it's real. But I named it, so I made it real. You see, because I named it, therefore I made it real. I named myself, therefore I am unique. I have now become real by naming myself. Do you understand how this works? You see, we're not dealing with geniuses here who strictly follow the dictionary definition of the philosophy. No. These are people that take an idea, misunderstand it, corrupt it for their own benefit, are entirely willful, and then they just go nuts. Does that Hopefully that makes sense, right? And then, of course, you get the, the apologists, like, uh, what's his name? It was in the chat earlier. It's like, well, actually, you know, if you look at the dictionary, and the dictionary says that 
nominalism is A plus B equals C minus D plus 3 minus 2. And the answer is 4.1. And therefore, nominalism is 4.1. Except the people that are doing the nominalist thing are fucking idiots. Okay? They are deranged lunatics. They don't care about the rules. You open the door and the law of unintended consequences takes over or the law of deliberate consequences takes over and these people just go ape because they've got no filter, they've got no boundaries and they just go nuts. The Navy taught you that perception is reality, but that's a two-edged term. Perception is reality is a two-edged term as well. So we've got to be careful. But Yeah, but that's the same thing. That's a Gnostic view. <clears throat> so then there's Gorgias. He goes even further. Gorgias claims that nothing exists. Nothing exists. And if it does exist, if it does exist, you can't know anything about it. It's not possible because you're trapped inside your skin, inside your brain, and that stuff is out there and you can't interact with it. Right? <clears throat> but okay, well, fine. Okay, maybe you can interact with it. Maybe you can know about it. But if you, you can't communicate it, you can't communicate outside of your skin to the next guy next to you because it's not possible. You're trapped inside your head. You're trapped inside your skin. It's not possible to communicate anything. You, you can't share any truth. There is no truth to be shared anyway. There's nothing out there anyway. It's just what's in your head. So this is a nominalist rejection of shared truth and objective reality. Do you understand? This idea is just craziness. Aristotle and Plato opposed these radical thinkers. Now, this is not to say that Plato wasn't insane himself, okay? One fine day when I get around to Plato, we're going to say, Plato was an amazing man, the greatest thinker to ever live. Plato was amazing, okay? No, Plato was... Yeah, we'll talk about Plato another time, but Plato should have been dragged outside and shot a long time ago, okay? <clears throat> so, Aristotle and Plato opposed these idiots, right? So they believed in stable forms, they believed in essences, and these essences and forms defined what things are. These are universals that exist independent of the particulars, of the characteristics that we see. Heraclitus saw only superficial change, right? Things are just changing on the surface. These people saw an unchanging reality beneath it, right? So there's a form, there's a substrate, God, if you will, right? So while Protagoras proclaimed radical subjectivism, right? They proclaimed realism, a mind-independent world of forms. Now, here's the thing. How do nominalists who claim that, that no one has any truth, how can they claim that their bullshit is true, that they are right if the stuff is only good for what's in their head? Seriously, how does a nominalist claim anything if, if they have literally only subjective reality? How do they claim anything and impose it on you? How is it, how's it valid for you? How can they claim that this is true? If everything is subjective, how can they make objective claims? If they say, if they say this is an absolute claim, how can they make an absolute claim? It's, it's, no, they can't. So these people are not consistent in any way. So in ancient Greek philosophy, there's a tension between these radicals. You get the nominalist-like views, and you get, okay, these guys avoid the universals, they avoid objectivity, versus the guys who defend realism and, you know, natural kinds, like objectivity. So... Eventually, the realists dominate, but nominalist sentiments persist and they re-emerge, right? So this points to perennial tendencies. Humans are able to go wrong, pardon me, and people are exploiting it. And today we're seeing how this is going wrong. So Aristotle and others, they established a philosophical bulwark. Christianity established a realist philosophical bulwark against these crazy ideas, right? And this shaped the Western world, this created science, right? But of course, now that is all coming apart. Science is corrupt because now you've got nominalism, subjectivism, relativism that has entered into it. That's why it is not a legitimate philosophy. It is a mistake. It is an error. It is corruption. So the thing about Christianity states clearly there's only one teacher or master. This makes sense because none of us could be a person to say, I know everything only. No one's saying that, right? I know everything. We can know some things. We can be experts in various topics. We can be examples to others. Right. <clears throat> so the ancient Greeks, right? These ancient Greeks had views that were very crude by today's standard, but they were they had an idea, shall we say, a negative idea that has persisted. They understood it. And this idea has only developed and evolved. And today with modern sophistry, we're now seeing how this idea is playing out. Nominalists do not hold that reality is subjective. All nominalists do is reject the existence of abstraction. That is all. That's so nice. Do you speak for all nominalists, Kevin? I mean, are you the king of the nominalists? Are you the president of the nominalists? 
do you speak for every single one of them? Do you have a list where they've all signed it and said, Kevin speaks for us? Because are they all geniuses like yourself? And they all have like studied the dictionary definition. They've read through the the Princeton, you know, um, the, the Princeton, um, what's it, the, the School of Philosophy. They've got this fantastic dictionary of philosophy and the, you know, the encyclopedia of philosophy at Princeton. They've all read it. They all understand that these are the rules. Don't break them because the answer is no, that's bullshit. You know it and I know it. So, you see, if all nominalists were as, uh, were, what's the word here? Um, apologists, as good as you, right? Then, um, yeah, I see, you're trying to put lipstick on a pig. You're trying to polish the turd. You're trying to put cream on, on, a, on, a, on a pile of poop. Understand? This idea, taken to its logical extreme, this is where we are. Not even to a logical extreme, it's taken itself here, but this is the logical outcome of this pile of bollocks. Right? And you're not dealing with lots of smart people who, just like Westerners, who are benefiting from capitalism and then promote socialism, right? Because socialism has only produced death and poverty. So, yeah, it's like you benefit from realism, but then you want to promote these crazy ideas because the society allows it. And then, of course, you are a parasite destroying the society. So you only speak for yourself, understand? That is purely your opinion. And of course, according to nominalists, there is no outside objective world. Everything is true only for you. So that is true purely for you. So you should say, my opinion is. Please preface all of your terms with, my opinion is. That's how that works. There are no universals here, right? So, and of course, atheists. For instance, I did a series on atheism. I had 80, 85 different definitions of atheism from Oxford, Harvard, all of the major textbooks, all of the major encyclopedias, all of the major atheist um, scholars, right, with their books. And then every Tom, Dick, and stupid atheist was like, well, you know, that's not true atheism. I'm like, I thought you guys loved science. I've just provided 80 or 85 of the top cream of the academic references. And everyone's like, well, you know, I'm embarrassed by that. So therefore, I'm going to make up my own definition. That's exactly atheists making up their own gender. They may as well make up their own gender. They may as well make up their own number system. They may as well make up their own words. Yes, it is just your own opinion. It is nothing more than your own opinion, right? So yeah, I know I know exactly there's that one lovely paper that I one fool you're reading. I mean, seriously, go and invent mathematics without numbers. That's what nominalists do. So... The SCP defines it that I agree with your point about atheism. No, you guys are just as, there's nothing different. So anyway, uh, it's been nice, but uh, we'll see you in a while. So there is something in human nature that we know rebels, and we call this sin, right? From a Christian point of view, this is sin. So something in us rebels against the idea of truth, of objective truth, the logos, right? It rebels against fixed natures and immutable truths. Right? The things that God has made, God doesn't change. If God is that pillar that doesn't change, then that means his nature is, is present in the world. That means it's rebellion against the Logos. <coughs> so some part of the human spirit wants radical freedom and malleability. It wants to be God. Okay, Artsy Fartsy, welcome. You can always play it fast from the beginning. I listen at like 1.75. So nominalism and relativism emerged again in the Middle Ages with Occam. Right, the sophists of the Enlightenment. I will dig into the Enlightenment in depth and the occult Enlightenment, we should call it, and today's postmodernists. Right, so they want to break free of perceived shackles, unquestioned dogmas. This also Marx was a, was fantastic at this. This was Marx's idea as well. Right, so it leads to philosophical incoherence and nihilism. In other words, modernism. So the philosophies of Plato, Aristotle, and natural law tradition provided a counterbalance. In other words, this stuff, this is Babylon. We are looking at Babylon coming back because we have lost sight of reason. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so let's continue. Let's, let, let me go to page 50. Let's see if I can get to page 50. That's like halfway. And um, then I'll, I'll just mention one or two things at the end. Okay, yeah, well, Artsy, yeah, definitely. Uh, Rewatch after work. So, okay, let's see. They articulate truths about human nature, ethics, and society. So basically, you get Aristotle, you get Aquinas and others. These people speak truths about human nature, ethics, and society that are not just human constructs, but are rooted in the structure of reality, right? So truth, truth needs to be subjective, right? 
So as conservatives and Christians, we have to continue to defend objective truth, right? Traditional values and the wisdom of the ages against this incredibly corrosive influence of this crazy subjectivism. And there's a tug of war between these two poles of human thought. And this is that's basically the battle with sin. I would, I would phrase it like that. So now, Aristotle and Aquinas, right? They engaged with these radical philosophies, right, in many ways. So how did they do it? And what, what can we do to repeat what they did? How can we bring back reason? So the philosophers that fought for realism, right, that established the Western world that we know, they articulated well-reasoned defenses of realism and universals, right? Aristotle argued that essences are real features of the natural world, not just personal concepts that we impose, right? Whereas they believe that they can impose a name and thus they've changed the world by changing a label, right? Aquinas built on this. He says that universals pre-exist in the mind of God and are shared by the particulars, your soul, right? You share that. This is shared amongst all of you. Right? And they gave logical arguments for realism. They provided empirical evidence for essences and natural kinds. Right? Now, Aristotle pointed to how we can group substances based on their shared forms. So we have to be able to categorize things. Family. Think about it. Look at what's happening on the U.S. southern border. Right? You have a dividing line between one category or one group and another category and another group. Inside, outside, us and them. You look at your liberals. These are crazy people that, that lack a dividing line between us and them. They, are, they actually prefer the outgroup. They don't look after themselves. They don't respect themselves. But they don't respect that borderline either because they want to erase those things. They don't have the separation, right? Because, yeah, they don't want categories. There are no universals. If there's no universals, then everything is the same. Understand? So this is causing all sorts of political chaos, social chaos. Right, and I, I can't understand how someone who claims to be intelligent is um, arguing for this kind of thing. Right, and of course, when you look at the Christians who promoted nominalism, sorry, not Christians, the heretics like William of Ockham, right, and Martin Luther, when people are going, well, you know, actually, nominalism is actually fantastic, fantastic stuff, and you go, yeah, you guys created insanity. Why would why would I want to listen to anyone who's that dumb? Now. So Aristotle says how we can group substances based on shared forms. Aquinas argued from observation. Realism aligns with our experiences of a mind, independent world with consistent recurrent patterns. They critique the logical inconsistencies and absurdities of nominalism, right? For Aristotle, for something to change, it must possess an underlying essence or nature that remains constant throughout the change process. Think of this. You grow up, right? You were a baby, right? And you look completely different once you were seven years old. And you looked very different when you were 12. You looked very different at 19. And again, you looked very different at 30, right? You're very different at 50. You're very different at 80. You are changing, but you are still you. So there's an essence that remains you. Understand? So you still remain you. So while something is changing, a certain essence remains constant throughout the change process. So if nominalism denies the existence of such universals, it becomes very difficult to explain how something can undergo change and yet still maintain a coherent identity. And yet we know we can maintain a coherent identity, consistent identity throughout our lives, right? So he also noted that nominalism eliminates causes and explanatory power. We cannot explain things as they are if they have no natures and forms. No explanation is consistent. Science falls apart. Science completely falls apart. Theories fall apart. And of course, what's going to happen is you're going to have Dr. Kevin here who's going to come along and say, well, you know, I've got a very smart explanation for that. Now, look, we'll, we'll look at Dr. Kevin's stuff later of, you know, the, one of the guys he references, which he mentioned some words from. Um, so we we'll look at we we'll look at some of that. But these guys can't agree either. They, they have seriously, they, they argue like like freaking Protestants over over sacraments and everything theological. They just can't come to any consensus either. They, they're not they don't have clear ideas. It's just everyone's it's like Gnostics of poop so yeah there's nothing consistent zero consistency so whatever fancy words and fancy arguments and well lord it's just about the abstractor just the abstractor like what does that even mean but the point is these guys have no consistency they're all fighting left and right and there's no consistency whatsoever so yeah there's yeah whatever 
Uh, the big reason is demographic change, illegal immigration vote. Of course, we know this, but the thing is the philosophy that, that empowers this, right? I mean, there's certain other reasons, but there's a philosophy that also empowers this. It makes it possible to think in this way. And, um, you know, are these just rationalizations after the fact, you know? And if these people are a death cult, they want to destroy and wipe out reason, then I've got it. Yeah, it's all going to go that way. So importing millions of leftists is often permanent power for lefties. Yeah, of course, we all know that. Syrian proverb, secure your home, then trust your neighbor. Yeah, trust in God, but tie your camel first, as the Arabs would say. These extra biblical philosophies seem like an excuse to indulge in personal deviance. Catherine M., you are 100% correct. Yes. Um, and they'll argue with you and say, well, you know, they're just going to say that we just want to sin. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay, so you lose explanatory power. You cannot, there's no consistency whatsoever if every particular is random. If no two dogs are alike, if, if one dog's a banana and the other one's a handbag and the third one's a crab, what explanatory power is there? Then it's just shit that you're making up. Okay, now, ah, oh, let's look at Martin Luther for a moment. So dead naming is a crime. Let's look at contradictions. So nominalism, now here's one of the incoherencies of nominalism. Okay, 45,000 different Protestant groups can't be all right. Can't all be right. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, we'll talk about that uh, soon as well. So in nominalism, a trivial change of personal name is seen as a radical alteration of change. So when Arthur becomes Martha, look, I changed my name. I'm a woman now. Can you tell? Can you tell? This five o'clock shadow, very sexy. If you don't like five o'clock shadow, maybe I'm not the woman for you. Yeah. So I've changed my name to Martha. And I've made a radical change. But if you call me Arthur, I'll, get, I'll sue you, right? So names, they claim, are just labels or arbitrary signs that we use to refer to individual objects or concepts, right? Therefore, changing someone's name would theoretically be considered as just creating a new label. So the label, it's just a label. It doesn't mean anything, right? And the thing that is being labeled has no objective existence. So you have no objective existence and you've slapped the label on it. How that is coherent, I don't know. But from a nominalist perspective, now they contradict themselves. This change in name would not retain any of the previous essence or nature of the previous thing. You see, Arthur was a man with that essence. And then once you change it to Martha, boom, something changes. And it's now Martha, 100%. It's a woman. You see, so the name change was just a random label on something that doesn't exist. Something that has no objective reality. But except that when you change the name, the objective reality of the thing that doesn't exist, that has no reality, changes. Do you understand how ridiculous this is? How this is completely incoherent? So you now are creating something entirely different or something new by changing the name, which is called magic. So nominalism says that the underlying reality, right, is based on its, its you've changed the name, you've changed the reality, right? So a logical contradiction arises because from this fact that nominalism views names as arbitrary labels, they are completely arbitrary, yet changing a name is seen as creating a new thing. So you've changed the name, it's arbitrary, it's completely arbitrary. You can call it a dog, you can call it a, a computer mouse, you can call it a torch, doesn't matter. But if you call Arthur Martha, you're dead naming them and you'll go to jail because you know that's happening today. Do you understand how ridiculous this is? It makes no sense. And of course, it's meant to make no sense. So it's designed to cause chaos and destruction and confusion. No more twigs and berries, so faux fruits on the tree makes me a she. Exactly. So this implies that the name has inherent meaning or essence. So in other words, they're, they're, they're implying that the name actually has critical function. The naming, the word, has critical essence. The name is loaded. The word is, is loaded with meaning. The word is loaded with identity, except the word is meaningless. It's an arbitrary label. It's just a social construct you made up that means nothing, which you slap onto something that has no objective reality. But when I change the name, that name tells you that this thing's essence has changed. It has become something totally different. My head is going to explode. Can you understand how insane and backwards and crazy this is? Do you see how these people are talking literally out of both sides of their mouths at the same time? They are utterly contradictory, and this is insanity. And of course, Kevin's going to defend this. Well, Lloyd, actually, it's about abstracta. So, okay, 
So this contradicts the fundamental principle of nominalism. Just like atheists contradict themselves, nominalists contradict themselves. Just like materialists contradict themselves, so do these fools. So I'm so-called, I'm hearing so-called intellectuals using a term called heuristic. The term sounds what like Lloyd teaches. Ah, thank you. Heuristics, yeah. A heuristic is a shortcut. It's a mental shortcut, if you will. But actually, I teach that when I do my stuff. I, I teach people about heuristics, how to, how to create mental heuristics. But that does take time, experience. It's There's certain certain deliberateness that has to go into your training. But this cognitive dissonance, do you understand? I, I know I may be repeating some things over and over, but I'm providing different examples, different perspectives. But do you understand how this is completely just, it's just chaos. So if names are label, okay, if names are just labels, then changing the label should not result in a new thing, except changing the label creates a new thing. Do you understand? There is no consistency here. And okay, maybe Kevin is the one, one only nominalist on the planet who's got his story together. Everyone else is just absolutely screwed in the head. So my thoughts here are F you, Martin Luther, for bringing this incoherent trash into Christianity. Seriously, Martin Luther, F that guy. Honestly, honestly, this, Protestants need to be ashamed. Honestly, seriously, when I... This is Martin Luther. This is what Martin Luther brought into the Protestant church. So, yeah. Right. Cognitive dissonance reflects a desire to hold the to falsehood rather than truth, just like the Bible says. Well, then Martin Luther was a heretic and a blasphemer that created a church which was... He just mixed the truth with the lie. He stuck the lie onto the truth and he created corruption. So, yeah, thank you, Catherine. I'm thrilled for the repetition. It's how I learn. And no, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, okay, let's finish this slide. So, they went through coercion and lawfare because it's so unreasonable. It's so irrational. They have to use force. They have to use lawfare, right? So, these people, so Aristotle Aquinas, they integrated realism into a broader, coherent philosophical framework. Mixing truth with lie is rat poison. Yes, appealing but deadly. Exactly. It's putting poison into food. You're mixing something good with something bad, but ultimately that means it's corrupt. Understand? So there's a there's something, Martin Luther created something toxic at the end of the day. It's just incredible that, I mean, it, yeah, it was a small change that eventually over time the crack has widened. And we'll talk more about that. So, so Aristotle's theory of four causes and hylomorphism depend on essences, right? Aquinas took realism into his systematic Christian theology and metaphysics. So they created self-consistent systems, which is unlike the craziness we just described in nominalism, right? So hylomorphism is Aristotle's theory that all things are made up of matter and form. Matter is the underlying substance. It takes on different forms. Form is the arrangement, right, which gives the matter its properties. So together, matter and form explain the existence and the nature of objects. Matter gives you existence, right? Your form gives you your characteristics, so they work alongside the four causes to provide a comprehensive understanding of how things exist and function. We discussed that previously. So, so they show how realism supports ethics and supports politics. Now, if you cannot identify a woman, how can you apply the law evenly? So if there's no shared human nature, what is the source for objective moral rules or natural law? Right? If there's no abstracts, if there's no numbers, how do you know that the change that you gave me, I give you a 200, you give me back five dollars and the thing costs ten dollars you should give me 190 and you give me five dollars and say well then um, those are just abstract numbers don't exist cheers have a nice day right think about it so aristotle and aquinas they grounded ethics in human nature and in universals and nominalism leads to subjectivity and relativism so you go from logic and empirical and ethical arguments right to the craziness that we just described so we must use reasoned analysis we must use use evidence and through this method, realism was established as the most compelling view. And through nominalist, nominalist tendencies, though, have endured and they've come back hard, right? <clears throat> so it took months to memorize the times tables in fourth grade and 54 years later, it's instant recall. Yeah, repetition is athletic training for the mind. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. So uh, Villainous says, oh, it's anti-Christ. Christ is the word of God. Through the word comes reality, creation. Through the word of man comes nominalism, the lie of a fake world and reality. And very well said. Yeah, very well said, uh, Villainous. Yes. 
So shades of gray is just white contaminated with black. It's light contaminated with darkness. Exactly. So the laws of logic. So let's do a couple slides on logic. So the law of identity is one of the most fundamental principles of logic. This states that a thing is always the same as itself. I am always me. You are always you. This torch is always a torch, right? This torch remains a torch, right? So it cannot be something else. This torch can't become a chicken, right? It can't become a computer mouse, right? So for example, a tree is a tree. It cannot be both a tree and not a tree, right? You are you. You cannot be someone else. A man is a man. He cannot be a woman. Those are different categories. That's why we have the words, the labels, which are loaded with meaning and identity. So in short, A is A. B is B. C is C. Have I heard of the ship of Theseus thought experiment, Lloyd? I, it's vaguely familiar, but I, yeah, it's vaguely familiar. It sounds vaguely familiar, right? This tree identifies as a pot plant here. Yeah. So this, everything has a single unchanging identity, right? Imagine God has a changing identity based on the person. That means you get how many gods? That That's seriously, God is one nature. But if God has the nature based on your opinion, then of course you are your own church, right? So the law of non-contradiction is a corollary of the law of identity. This states that a statement cannot be both true and false at the same time. For example, the statement, the sky is blue, cannot be both true and false simultaneously, right? The sky cannot both be blue and not blue in the same place at the same time. A thing cannot have contradictory properties. You can't be wet and not wet. You can't be wet and dry at the same time. Now, of course, there can be a distinction. You can be wet on one side or wet on top and dry on the bottom or something like that. You can be partly wet, right? But you can't be, for instance, completely wet and completely dry at the same time. That is, that that violates the law of non-contradiction. Yes, so the whole trans deception is wrapped up in changing the law of identity. Exactly, that's what's called identity politics. Understand? So, you can't have your cake and eat it too. A thing is always itself, and a statement is either true or false. It cannot be paradoxically both, right? So these laws are fundamental to rational thinking. And of course, nominalism and the woke Gnosticism, all of this upends this. It contradicts this. It violates this. So these laws lead to rational thinking and logical consistency. So without them, clear and coherent thought would not be possible. Right? So we rely on these principles in all of our thinking. This is the foundation of Western thought. These are the three rules of thinking, the three rules of thought, the three laws of thought. There's a third one, right? the law of the excluded middle. Like, for instance, if you're pregnant, you either are pregnant or you're not pregnant. You're not both. You're not a little bit pregnant. You pick one. Pick a side. Okay? Your house, your car is either blue or it's black. Pick one. You can't be a little, you understand it, if, you want it, if you're speaking in terms of that. Like, this is either a mouse or it's a torch. Pick one. It can't be both, understand? This is either a phone or it's a mouse. Pick one. You know, it's either one thing or the other. It's a phone. It can't be, so, right? <clears throat> so, we rely on these principles every day, and this is the bedrock of Western reasoning, right? So, now, decolonizing education and other ways of, other ways of seeing the world, okay? So now you get these social movements that argue that traditional logic and reasoning are oppressive. You nasty white people, you oppressing the world with logic, okay? And this threatens my identity because my identity changes every 10 minutes. Look, look I'm a butterfly, right? And we use things like postmodern philosophies that claim that objective truth and logical reasoning do not exist. Well, well, well. You see, luckily for us, Kevin only doesn't believe in abstractor. You see, so he believes that, that um, you know, just, 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 just that, you know, and, and the rest, well, I mean, yeah, except that other nominalists take it a lot further. In fact, most of them take it way further. So Kevin only speaks for himself. So they argue that logic is merely a means for those in power to assert control over marginalized groups. You see? Yeah, we need to decolonize reason and rationality. So by rejecting objective truth, they believe they are empowering oppressed identities and oppressed minorities, liberating them from the shackles of logical thinking. Yeah, in other words, they're enabling chaos. They're enabling depravity. They're enabling immorality. Understand, the language is always backwards. They mix the truth with the lie. Yeah, non-tradicath is a telling nickname. He's not even Catholic. He's not even Catholic. 
okay? Non-traditional Catholic. I mean, that's, that, that itself is a contradictory name. So, certain radical activist groups portray logic and rationality as tools of oppression, but threaten the ideologicals, the, the ideal, ideologies and identities, of course, because reason would say, you're a man, shut up. Not a woman, shut up, right? So, therefore, these are tools of oppression because they're not allowing him to be free. They're not, it's not always free to be something, it's freedom from something, freedom from reason, freedom from morality, freedom to do whatever the heck they want. Right? So they claim logical reasoning is a veil for biases and prejudices, right? And they always frame the debate as a struggle between oppressor and oppressed. So now we're back to Karl Marx. Now we're back to Marxist thinking. Now we're back to dualistic, Gnostic thinking, Manichaean thinking. So logic is an enemy to be fought. These people, you must understand, are your enemies. They literally are your enemies. It's that simple. You have to win this fight. So, yeah. So, yeah, they should not be allowing Muslims in their churches. No. It's about drawing hard lines. You have, you might, you have to have boundaries. You have to have borders. So it's about demonizing what is good. Woe to those who call good evil and evil good. Exactly, pigs can fly. It is about demonizing good. Do you understand? The language really it's it's a very subtle language but this is this is it sounds rational this is sophistry this is very good sophistry it's superbly good and you have to learn to spot it right <clears throat> so someone may declare themselves but they are not declaring what they are not exactly so they're not being truthful what you'll find is once you open the door it's the slippery slope and eventually you find yourself in a race to the bottom so many of these people are arguing for the rejection of Western logic and philosophy in favor of alternative ways of knowing, right? Epistemologies that they believe give greater voice to marginalized groups, like people who maybe hate you and think that you stole their stuff and think that mathematics is uh, for fools and maybe cleanliness is not next to godliness. And what do you understand? This just, everything degrades rapidly. That's why there's poop on the streets in San Francisco. That's, it's that simple. So they claim that traditional logic comes from assumed superiority and implies that knowledge, that other knowledge systems are inferior. You see? Well, yeah, they are inferior. What you need to understand is they are inferior cultures. Other knowledge systems are inferior. They are. They just bluntly are. So they want to decolonize thought by promoting alternative logics, except irrationalities. Atheists constantly call themselves those who merely lack belief. Yeah, that's a, what a fantastic joke. So let's finish on this slide, guys, on slide 50. Are you imposing your whiteness on me, right? So certain ideological movements argue that science and reason threaten their belief systems, their identities, and their values, right? Logical thinking is a threat that must be rejected in order to protect their constituencies. For instance, for transgender to exist, we have to reject science. We have to reject genetics. We have to reject biology, basic biology, right? We have to reject established science and established culture. Do you understand? So therefore, the transgender community is anti-science. The whole point of nominalists is anti-science. I am assuming your gender. Pig can fly. So that one MP in Great Britain was slaughtered in his church. Yeah, tolerant Muslims. Yeah, exactly. So emotion and personal beliefs are elevated over reason and evidence. Thank you, Martin Luther, for that. The arguments in all these cases are flawed and self-defeating. Hopefully I've pointed that out. Logic is not a tool of oppression. Logic does not belong to any one group. Logic comes from the logos the word must be true this is how we determine what is true this is how we use our reason god gave you reason except luther says god didn't so it is a universal human capacity and a tool for seeking truth and solving problems so now of course anything can be applied in flawed and biased ways but logic is essential for moral and intellectual progress we need reason right we need method so rejecting reason in the name of any ideology or identity is delusion and folly by people who lack merit. They want to simply claim because they feel they are owed. Morally, they've now become corrupt because they want stuff. They want to take stuff from you and they want to make you feel guilty. They want to guilt you because of your success, because of your merit, because of your method. And they just want to take stuff from you because they cannot produce. They can only destroy. They can only take. Marxism, again. Logic is not a tool of oppression. But understand, all of this argumentation that I'm showing you, all of this, this is not logic. They're not using logic. This is sophistry. These are lies. It's an attack on your society. It is an attack on your morality. It is an attack on your culture. It's an attack on your identity. 
It's an attack on who you are as a person, who you are as a culture, who you are as a religion. All of this is an attack. It is not designed to find a reasonable middle ground. It is designed to undermine you, undermine and destroy. So logic is the foundation of our knowledge and of our civilized thought, right? Without respect for the law of identity and objective truth, rational discourse breaks down. We cannot define and we cannot distinguish anything from anything else. That's why it's all the same. You know, these people say that's all the same, that indifferentism. Right? Now you're talking about another form of nominalism. These are just different forms because everyone makes it up themselves as they go. Gnostics did it the same. They just made up their own nonsense. If you've got a thousand people with a thousand different ideas about this, the same idea, it's like you've got chaos. Yeah, reject reality, embrace fantasy, and stay in your mother's basement. Exactly. So now this has consequences in every sphere of life. Hopefully I've demonstrated from politics to law to ethics to sport, personal relationships to the border. Right? Everything is being corroded and everything is being destroyed. So um, I'll finish on slide 50, but just so you know, Martin Luther, now Protestants, I've, I've, seen, the, I've seen the discussions, I've looked at them. They all claim, no, 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 Martin Luther was not a nominalist. That's wrong. Oh yeah, sure. When you look at one quote, yeah, you can say that. Look at a lot of quotes and you realize, yeah, that's wrong. They're lying. Uh, Martin Luther did call William of Ockham his dear teacher. You know, my dear leader. My dear leader. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we'll talk about that some more. So, guys, I will stop here. Hopefully, this has been educational. You've learned something. And for the 80 of you or more that have joined me, I thank you for that. Thank you for your time. Thank you again for the donation earlier. That's really, really kind. I do appreciate it. Um, the pinned comment for with a little main on top has a link to this presentation in the chat. Um, please follow up with me privately. Just drop me a, a message, um, either you know, I'll buy a coffee so that I can I can up, give you the updated slides. I'll, I'll try and update them either tonight or tomorrow because I've added some additional slides. Uh, Karl Marx shows in bed with when he shows the hidden handmaster of the second value. Well, as I said, we're going to go from the Freemasons. We're going to go from Napoleon to the Freemasons, Freemasons to the Carbonari. Carbonari to the Alta Vendita, and from the Alta Vendita to Karl Marx. And then from Karl Marx, we're going to go to Satan. And we're going to wonder how we got there. Slippery slope indeed. So, so it's interesting to see how woke is effective magic. Thanks, Andrew Martin. Yeah, I didn't want to dive heavily and deeply into the idea of magic. I mean, there's probably a way, it probably can be explained better if I dug deeper, but I wanted to sort of show how this is kind of a, there's a parallel with, with word magic. There's a parallel with that ineffectual magic but yeah it, look it's actually it's very effective it's created confusion right it's created incredible confusion it's 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 actually it's taken over people's minds it's parasitic this idea is parasitic it's it's ruined people's minds right so josephine says don't tone it down people have been coddled long enough and that's the problem yeah we need bonergis what is that his foolish things his blessed his blessed messes rock well thank you yeah um, I love video games, but I can almost no longer play them because of the wokeness and ridiculous content lately. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, so thanks, guys. Rhetoric is entry-level brainwashing. Muslims call it logic. Yeah, it's called Adab al-Jadal. That's what they... Yeah, the Reformation. The Reformation was... Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll dig deeply when I get into Luther. Dig deep into the Reformation. Solvet coagula. I know, I can't remember what that term means. Karl Marx. Okay, so guys, I think that's it. Um, do court jesters have any connection with the Freemasons? I mean, maybe they were. I don't know. I, I have no idea. Um, so guys, thank you very much. Gad Sad wrote the book, The Parasitic Mind. Yeah. Well, remember, do, do people have ideas or do ideas have people? That's a Jordan Peterson quote. Do ideas have people? And notice the conversion between all of these crazy theologies that are extra-biblical, extra-biblical, as someone said. So guys, thank you very much. I need to go and get some dinner. It's uh, quarter to 20 to 9 here. But thanks for the time. Hope it's been a great conversation. I will see you on, if not Saturday, I might do that. Otherwise, on Sunday. Um, and also next week, I'm going to do three episodes with um, Thunderous. He's coming back. So we're going to be doing three separate episodes with Thunderous. And that's going to be really interesting. We've got a plan for three separate topics. And uh, he's going to be leading the discussion, so that's going to be very interesting. So thanks, guys. I'm I'm glad, Lil Main. Thank you for the support. Robothug, welcome. Dr. Obvious, great to see you. Andrew Martin and others. Guys, until next time, God bless. Bye, Catherine. Take care.